Hi, Josh. Good afternoon. I want to ask Dr. Shaw to give his report, and then I'll have a statement about some uh, changes we're making. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Mills. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nirav Shaw. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We're joined today, in addition to Governor Mills, we're joined by Commissioner Heather Johnson of DECD and Commissioner Jean Lambrew of DHHS. We're here today, Friday, May 8th, to provide an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state. And we unfortunately begin today's briefing on a sad and somber note. Maine CDC is reporting the 63rd individual with COVID-19 who has passed away. He was a man in his 60s in Hancock County. And he leaves behind him his friends, his family, and his community. And we, all of us, share our condolences with those in his life who are grieving his loss at this time. Overall, Maine CDC is reporting 1,374 cases of COVID-19 across the state, an increase of 44 cases since yesterday. Of those 1,374, 1,264 are laboratory confirmed and 110 are probable. Overall, there have been 192 individuals who have, hosp who have been hospitalized and presently 44 individuals who are currently hospitalized. Of those 44 individuals, 23 are in intensive care units and 10 are on ventilators right now. As I mentioned a moment ago, there have been 63 individuals who have passed away and 836 who have recovered. That's an increase of 49 recoveries since yesterday. And overall, there have been 296 healthcare workers who have tested positive for COVID-19, bringing our cumulative state average to approximately 21.5% of all of our cases comprised by healthcare workers. Overall, I'd like to just provide a quick update on some of the, our, the outbreaks that we're managing. At the Tyson Poultry Processing Plant in Portland, there continue to be the same number of cases as we reported yesterday, a total of 51 cases. The facility there has begun their operations yesterday and we continue to work with Tyson Foods as well as all the individuals who have tested positive to do our normal contact tracing process to see who they may have been in contact with and make sure we touch base with those individuals to provide them timely public health advice. Also at the Springbrook Center, there is now an additional case, bringing the total number of cases at the Springbrook Center to 14, 13 residents and one staff member in total. Again, we continue to work with our colleagues at the Springbrook Center to provide them information on COVID-19 prevention, hospital, or I'm sorry, healthcare associated prevention, infection information, as well as the necessary supplies of PPE that they may require. I'd like to provide next a couple of updates on our public health emergency preparedness activities. And the first is on the deployment of our spiritual care core teams. Just in the past few days, our spiritual care core has worked to support facility chaplains and staff members on communications to family members at affected facilities, particularly long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We've been doing that by both supporting staff members as well as the families of individuals who live in those facilities. And we've done that, for example, by virtual Zoom meetings, both on an individual as well as on a group level in order to provide them and offer them grief counseling during these challenging times. We also have an on-call individual who's there at any time for any staff member who may need special assistance or just someone to talk to as those staff members at healthcare facilities are themselves coping with the loss and the grief of losing the people and the patients that they have cared for in some cases for many years. This work on providing for the spiritual side of individuals in the healthcare system is on top of the, warm, the, the frontline warm line 
that we stood up a few weeks ago in order to provide healthcare workers across the state a way to reach out and chat with somebody during their own times of grief and stress. I'd also next like to provide an update on the activities of our colleagues at the National Guard to engage in fit testing. Yesterday, our colleagues at the Guard fit tested 59 individuals, 30 at Port Resources in South Portland and 29 at Mount St. Joseph's. Today, just today alone, 125 individual healthcare workers across the state will be fit tested. This fit testing enables them to be able to utilize the N95 masks that we've talked so many times about. These are those masks that really do a great job preventing healthcare workers from inhaling the coronavirus particles. But before someone can wear and utilize those masks, they have to go through the fit testing process. Ever since we've begun that, co that joint operation with our colleagues at the National Guard, Almost 300 healthcare workers in Maine have been fit tested, and we have, at least just as of right now, another 600 on the list. And we're going to keep going as more and more healthcare providers across the state ask for and sign up to be fit tested. In terms of our continued distributions of personal protective equipment, just today alone, almost 60,000 pieces of personal protective equipment, 60,000 are going out to healthcare facilities across the state. This is part of our ongoing work to push out PPE to healthcare facilities, especially those that are on the front lines, whether that be nursing homes, local fire and EMS, or hospital systems, to make sure they've got everything they need to continue keeping our, our friends, our family members, those who are patients as safe as possible. Before I turn things over to Governor Mills, I wanted to just clarify two things from yesterday. The first is around our moves to increase our capacity for testing at the state level. As, as we discussed yesterday and as Governor Mills announced yesterday, the state of Maine will be more than tripling our internal capacity at our state laboratory in Augusta, more than tripling that capacity to conduct testing for COVID-19. Those tests will be run at our laboratory in Augusta, not at the IDEX facility. They'll be run at our laboratory in Augusta. And healthcare providers who already are used to the process of submitting tests to us can now submit tests for COVID-19 to us for their patients out of, without having to worry about resource constraints. However, before we can go fully online with that increased capacity, we have to conduct scientific tests to make sure that the equipment that we're using is up, ready, and running. That process takes a few days, and we anticipate being fully online sometime next week, probably by the end of next week, with that increased capacity. A lot of folks have asked about whether this is the same as universal testing. And I wanted to just take a second to differentiate the two. What we talked about yesterday is expanding the overall capacity at our state lab. Universal testing is a little bit different, even though it's related. Universal testing is what happens at the facility level. For example, if we detect an outbreak at a long-term care facility, a nursing home, we may recommend that the management of that facility engage in universal testing. That involves testing everyone, staff and residents alike, at the facility level and sending those swabs maybe to our laboratory or perhaps to another laboratory. So I just wanted to differentiate this too. The announcement we made yesterday is about expanding our lab's capacity, which will help facilitate universal testing, but the two are slightly different. And finally, I would just like to close with two sets of, or two observations. The first is a quick update on some of the numbers that we provide. The first is around the number of ventilators in the state. Uh, at present, there are 311 ventilators across the state, 200 of which are available. And finally, 411 alternative ventilators that remain available in the event they could be needed. And again, before I turn things over to Governor Mills, I wanted to just take a quick moment to thank one particular group of people. Uh, thanked a lot of folks during the course of these briefings, but there's one group that I have yet to thank that I think everyone in the state 
truly owes a debt of gratitude toward, and that is our mothers. Uh, being this, this being Mother's Day, I wanted to take a second to acknowledge each and every one of the mothers out there. Uh, hi, Mom. Hope you're doing well. Um, with that, Governor Mills, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you. I hope your mother's doing well as well. Um, thank you, and good afternoon again. You know, yesterday, we shared some good news. Uh, the news that the administration has secured a new partnership with IDEX to provide enough COVID-19 test supplies <clears throat> to more than triple our current testing capacity at the lab. And with that additional capacity, which we expect to be operational sometime next week, Maine CDC will be able to better gauge the prevalence of the virus throughout the state. This in turn opens the door to a new set of possibilities as we examine how to safely restart Maine's economy. When I unveiled the plan on April 27th, I said we would also look closely at opportunities for regionalizing uh, regional va variations, meaning are there some areas of the state that we can allow to safely open certain businesses before other areas? That flexibility is important, and we've been engaging with industries and uh, various sectors of the economy for weeks. States, counties, neighborhoods, businesses, and families are all feeling the impacts of this virus, but in sometimes different ways. It is therefore appropriate to tailor our approach to reflect these differences as best we can and in a manner that protects the health of the main people to the greatest extent possible. So today I'd like to announce uh, a rural reopening plan that is aimed at reopening certain additional businesses in more rural parts of our state over the next several weeks. I'm specifically referring to the counties where community transmission of the coronavirus is not present and where there are significantly fewer cases of the virus. Aroostook, Piscataquis, Washington, Hancock, Somerset, Franklin, I don't want to speak too fast. <laughs> um, Oxford, Kennebec, Waldo, Knox, Lincoln, and Sagadahawk counties, which also are some of our more rural counties, but they are counties which have not encountered community spread. Under this plan, in these counties only, Starting this coming Monday, May 11th, retail stores may open to in-store customers. In doing so, they must adopt the health and safety precautions that we are also releasing today. These include, but not limited to, <clears throat> restricting the number of customers in the store at any one time, enhancing cleaning and sanitation practices, and maximizing touch-free transactions wherever possible. Also, in these same counties only, beginning Monday, May 18th, restaurants may open for outdoor dining and for limited dine-in service. Also, with strict health and safety precautions that we are releasing today. These precautions include physically distancing customers, making sure employees follow enhanced hygiene and sanitation practices, and controlling customer flow by making reservations only whenever possible. For example, a small restaurant could imp implement reservation only service and use a text or call alert system to notify families waiting uh, inside their cars when their table is ready, to avoid having anyone stand in a waiting area, and to space out occupied tables at least six feet apart. This isn't going to be easy, but the industry has also weighed in, and we've respected their views and come to these accommodations. Servers in restaurants should be assigned to specific areas for their entire shift to avoid cross-contamination among staff. The restaurant should switch to laminated menus 
which can be cleaned more easily than paper. They should implement packaged single-serve condiments, minimizing the use of kiosks, tablets, pens, credit cards, receipts, and keys, and shut down common food areas like salad bars. All those things could easily spread this virus. The timelines for these reopenings align pretty well with the reopening of same businesses, similar businesses in New Hampshire. Also, in these same 12 counties, online, uh, beginning Monday, May 18th, remote campsites and sporting camps that provide access to wilderness activities, such as canoeing, hiking, hunting, and fishing, are permitted to reopen with public health safeguards. We're also making some small adjustments to the plan on a statewide basis as well. For instance, fitness and exercise centers, which were initially categorized in stage two, will now be permitted to open on May 11th, it's next Monday, for outdoor classes of 10 people or less, or for one-on-one -on -one personal training instruction. That's one at a time inside the gym. We are asking fitness instructors and personal trainers to use the general health and safety guidelines, guide, guidance that we are establishing. And those guidances, guidelines, which take the form of COVID-19 prevention checklists are found at the Department of Economic and Community Development website at maine.gov backslash DECD. That's D as in David, ECD as in David. With these changes, we're permitting these establishments to reopen, not requiring them to do so. If you are immunocompromised, or if you care for someone who is, you should not feel compelled to go back to work in such an establishment. And I urge all employers in these businesses to be flexible with their employees when considering reopening. Our plan also does not prevent a municipality from adopting additional public health measures, including perhaps additional restrictions on establishments within their jurisdictions. For now, retail stores and restaurants in York, Cumberland, Androscoggin, and Penobscot counties, where community transmission of COVID-19 has been established, they are not permitted to reopen for in-store shopping or dine-in service until June 1 at this point. That's the tentative start date for stage two. Community transmission in those counties continues to pose too big a risk to allow those businesses to operate. Although there are rural areas in some of those counties, the counties as a whole have seen too significant a spread. Those businesses, however, can continue to provide telephone order, curbside pickup, takeout, and home delivery services. Throughout this process, the Maine CDC will continue to monitor epidemiological data, including case trends and new hospitalizations, as well as healthcare readiness and cap capacity to inform decisions on the safety of lifting or reinstating restrictions. As of yesterday, Maine adjusted for our population ranks sixth lowest in the nation for positive cases, 36th in the nation in, in the terms of deaths, 27th in terms of patients ever hospitalized out of 32 total states reporting, and 10th in the nation in the percentage of people who have recovered out of the 38 states reporting. Our rankings are pretty good. Ultimately, the success of this rural reopening depends on two important factors. One, the ability of these businesses to implement and conscientiously follow 
these health and safety precautions, and two, the ability of Maine people themselves to strictly adhere to physical distancing, to wear face coverings to protect others, and to continue to practice good hygiene, including washing your hands often with soap and warm water, and keeping six foot distances between yourself and others. Now, if you are an older Mainer, or if you're a Maine person with an underlying health condition, please stay home as much as possible, regardless of where you live. Stay safe. And if you are someone considering going out to a restaurant or go shopping at Rennie's or to the co corner store, please keep in mind why physical distancing, why wearing a face covering, why these health and safety precautions are so important. The person next to you in line may have the virus and not know it, or you may have it and not know it. And if you ignore the public health guidelines, you risk the health of the person at the table next to you who may be undergoing treatment for cancer, or the child in line behind you who may have asthma, or the person across the counter from you who may be a nurse or a first responder treating people who are desperately ill. Please don't become the reason that they become sick or the reason they contract the virus and unknowingly pass it to a patient or a family member. These health guidelines are meant to protect them just as much as they are meant to protect you and your family. They are meant to protect our frontline workers, our doctors and nurses, store clerks and pharmacists, wait staff and countless others. Do it for yourself, do it for them all too. Ultimately, this rural plan is the next step in the gradual restart of our economy as we continue to put the health of Maine people first. My administration will continue to work with businesses and different sectors of the economy, solicit feedback from others, consult with public health experts, and strive to move our state forward in a thoughtful, deliberate way. So I say, let's continue to talk. Let's keep having the constructive dialogue. Please continue to give us your thoughts, your concerns, your ideas. We welcome all of them. To some who might say, these distinctions, these lines we're drawing are arbitrary, or to those who may say, well, why not my business in my area now instead of later? I say to them, we may not all be in the same boat, but we are in the same storm and we are all struggling and fighting these rough seas together. I, however, continue to be amazed by the confidence and courage of Maine people, hundreds of thousands of people and businesses who have bunkered down in the last eight weeks, I believe we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but the tunnel is a long one and there are still some dark corners ahead if we don't walk carefully. Let's take it one step at a time and navigate this storm together. Thank you. Great, thank you, Governor. I'm gonna invite Commissioner Johnson up here. So thank you, Dr. Shaw. I'm gonna um, moderate the questions for today, Governor. So first question today is from Ashley Blackford at WAGM. Ashley? Hi, I have a question. I have a question for um, both Governor Mills and Dr. Shaw. I'll start with Governor Mills. With this rural reopening plan, does this relax the stay healthier at home mandate and allow people to visit family and friends if it's under 10 people? visit family and friends. I guess it depends on where and how. We're still asking people to stay home as much as possible. That order is still in effect. Uh, and the order of gatherings, of limiting gatherings is still in effect as well. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. We're only modifying it in terms of the restaurants and retail uh, uh, folks in those 12 counties. 
everything else in the existing orders remains in effect. Okay, yep, that answers it. Now, my question for Dr. Shaw, um, how soon after a person is exposed or comes into contact with someone with COVID-19 will a test show an accurate result of whether or not they have the virus? Great, so Ashley asks about how long after someone is exposed would a test potentially show a positive result for the virus? Uh, Ashley, that's a great question. As we've talked about on a couple of occasions, it's not so much who to test, it's just as much when to test. And so what we know about coronavirus is that the test can become positive about two days or so after somebody gets exposed. For some people, it might be shorter. For other people, it might be longer. But on average, it takes the virus about two days to reproduce enough so that the, the blood tests that we use can actually pick it up and detect it in the body. Thanks, Ashley. I'll turn things back over to Commissioner Johnson. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Brad Rogers, WGME. All right, thanks. A couple of questions for uh, first for governor for the governor. Um, uh, you know, this is such a fine line that it seems like you have to walk with this. You know, you've got business owners and employees who may want to open early, but then others, uh, a lot of others, are still fearful about this. You know, what sort of message can you say just talking mm -hmm. to those two groups? Oh, good question, Brad. Brad asks about the quandary that businesses and employees have about being cautious about reopening or not wanting to reopen and nothing in what I've said or done requires anybody to open. And I understand why, um, first of all, it may be physically, logistically difficult for some businesses to reopen under these guidelines. Um, secondly, there may be many people who are reluctant to come back to work or businesses reluctant to open because they themselves are over 65 or going through cancer treatments or have asthma or some um, or diabetes or some underlying medical condition that puts them at risk. That is their choice and their decision. They have to make, they have to make the decision that's right for them, for their business, their family and their community. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Dr. Shaw, do you see the state doing away with the tiered system for priority testing next week, I guess? Is that the, the, the timetable? The question is whether he sees the tiered system going away as early as next week. And Brad, that, that is the expectation. That's our hope. There's a lot of steps that have to be taken between now and then. The machines are still on their way in. The test kits are on their way in. We've got to do all the scientific studies that the federal government requires us to do to prove that our lab can run the test according to the way that the US FDA has approved it. And so that process, and then we have to document all of those, those findings. That's just the scientific method. That process, however, takes about a week to do. So that's what our laboratory experts are doing right now as we speak. Then and only then will we send out a notice to physicians across the state officially telling them that the various tiers and prioritization systems have been removed. So as of right now, it's still in place while that scientific method is being undertaken. But as soon as we've crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's, and documented our success, then we'll send out a notice to healthcare providers. And again, we do expect that process to take about a week. <laughs> okay, next question from Megan uh, at WMTW. Thank you. I have a question for Governor Milk and Dr. Shaw. Governor Milk, I'd like to start with you if I could. Sure. Throughout this process, as we've talked uh, you know, a number of times about how um, these new guidelines would be enforced, a lot of it relies on, you know, self-policing honor system, as well as, you know, consumers being aware and being able to report. Yes. Is that also how um, you expect enforcement of these new guidelines to go in these additional 12 counties? Sure. You know, we don't live in a police state. But we live in a state that is under strict guidelines because of the public health pandemic that we're still in right now. Even though our numbers are low compared to many other states, we want to keep them low. So if a, if an, if a business intentionally violates or violates these guidelines, 
They could be subject to any number of sanctions on any number of levels from local police enforcement to a criminal prosecution to licensing violations to violations of the orders. But the biggest sanction, the biggest consequence for violating the order, violating the guidelines is that a customer, a staff person or the business owner themselves might well fall sick and even die from this virus. That's the huge, the biggest consequence that might follow from violating these guidelines. They are public safety, public health guidelines, first and foremost. Governor, can I, would it be okay to Please. add to that? You know, I think we've had a lot of discussion about this, right? We have a ton of confidence in the businesses in our state as well. They are the core and the heart of a lot of these communities and they take that responsibility incredibly seriously. They have a lot of respect for their employees and want the best only for their employees and their customers, right? In these small towns particularly, repeat customers are the only way for businesses to stay alive. So they feel it is absolutely their prerogative to protect their customers and the employees as well. So we don't, you know, we expect that most people will step into that role and take really good care of their employees, their customers, and their communities. So we look forward to that partnership. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and my my next question is for Dr. Shaw. I know that yesterday uh, you were talking about meeting with members of the pediatric community here in Maine to talk about what is this inflammatory illness seen in children. I wasn't sure if you had a, a chance to do that and if you did, if you had something to add about where we are in terms of uh, keeping an eye out for that or any children in Maine experiencing that. Uh, so Megan asks about our, our discussions with members of the pediatrics community about reports that have been seen among other places in New York City about a certain inflammatory condition that seems to be or has been noted to be associated with children with COVID-19. Uh, Megan, some of the medical epidemiologists and clinical advisors who work with the Department of Health and Human Services had that call. Based on what we've heard so far, there have not yet been reports of that inflammatory condition. Uh, it goes by the name of Kawasaki, Kawasaki's disease. There haven't been reports of that being observed in children in Maine associated with COVID-19. It is something that does occur in children, but in connection with COVID-19, we haven't yet received any reports of it. But of course, we want providers out there, any provider who cares for children, to be on the lookout, either for COVID-19, of course, or for Kawasaki's in the event that they could see that being um, one of the presenting symptoms of COVID-19. If we do detect that and if we see it happening in Maine, we'll certainly be letting everyone know. Okay, uh, Kevin Miller. Hi, uh, two, two questions for Dr. Shaw. Uh, <laughs> one, can you, can you give us a uh, update on the uh, contact tracing, uh, the hiring process, kind of now that we're leading up to this ramped up testing capacity, kind of where are you at? You've talked about the need to, to expand that, the staff that can actually do that contact tracing. We're gonna get all these test results back. You know, how quickly you can be able to hire up in that, that department. Great. Uh, so Kevin's first question is around our status hiring up folks for contact tracing. And uh, Kevin, the, the bottom line answer is that uh, because of the state of emergency that's been declared, the hiring process, particularly for something like contact tracing, is made a little bit more streamlined. And so as a result of that, we don't, uh, we don't foresee significant administrative challenges. We have, st we have been putting into place the plan that our epidemiologists have devised in terms of how to hire up both investigators as well as the, 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 the technical epidemiologists who would handle the more complicated investigations. And that plan has been implemented slowly. We'll get you the exact numbers of just who we've brought on in the past couple of days. In some cases, it's folks that are new to the agency. In other cases, it's folks from other parts of the agency who are providing other parts of services for example, it's not just sufficient for us to do contact tracing just for COVID-19. We also have to make sure that if we're asking somebody to stay in isolation for 14 days, we're also making sure we take care of any other behavioral health or medical needs that we've got. So we're bringing on case managers to do that. We'll get you the exact numbers of where we stand, uh, but we're, we're working toward our goal, always keeping in mind what the case counts are. 
Before I turn to your next question, Kevin, I just want to underscore that based on the staff that we have right now at CDC and the increases we've made just in the past few weeks, we are able to do full contact tracing investigations on each and every positive case. Might as well stay right here. Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, and a sec secondary, kind of more general question. Um, obviously, we're still seeing cases go up um, on a daily basis, you know, in part because of these outbreaks that, that we've uh, that you've detected at, at facilities. Um, can you talk just generally what, how much of the of the caseload that we're seeing come out is is because of these congregate care settings or workplaces? Then how much are we still potentially seeing community transmission, especially in, uh, you know, in Cumberland and York, York counties and those other counties? Uh. Sure. So Kevin asks about the, the composition of the increase of cases that we've seen. Uh, let me first start by noting, Kevin, that we have not detected community transmission in any new counties, just the four that we've talked about previously. Second is there was, of course, a big jump in cases yesterday. But a large part of that was the accumulation of tests that were done over several days at the Tyson facility. Had we reported them on a daily basis, the big spike that we saw yesterday would have been a lot more smooth. Uh, but you, that, that, that takes us to today. What can we say about the 44 cases that we've reported today? And generally speaking, who are we seeing as the composition of the new cases we're detecting. And it continues to be two significant or, or majority groups. The first are continued upticks in long-term care and other congregate settings. Uh, for example, whether that's nursing homes, whether that's group homes, assisted living facilities, those and, and shelters for people experiencing homelessness, those, con those continue to be a large fraction of our daily uptick. The other large group of cases where we see an uptick are in close contacts of confirmed cases, household members, spouses, children, family members who live with a confirmed case. We still do see the occasional case as a result of community transmission, but given that folks have been staying inside, abiding the governor's orders to stay inside, the number of incidental cases of transmission that we've seen from the community have really been, they've really fallen off. And that's because of the fact that people have obeyed and followed the governor's orders, not despite it, it's because of it. Um, thanks for that question, Kevin. Um, I will go ahead and turn next to Commodore Don Kerrigan for the next question. Catman. You're going to run out of, I think you're going to run out of titles eventually. Uh, I have two questions, I think, for Commissioner Johnson. <laughs> one very brief. And one for Dr. John. Oh, uh, I'll leave. <laughs> uh, one, I'm trying to clarify if the, if the civil state of emergency still ends on May 15th or if it will continue right right through and into June. And on the restaurants, um, I'm told that restaurants all over the state, including the four community transmission counties, uh, had made something of a plea to be allowed to open uh, in time for Memorial Day weekend. Is there any chance at this point that that might happen in those four counties? So, you know, we certainly have had a lot of dialogue with restaurants and, and retailers around Memorial Day, right? Memorial Day is this traditional kickoff to Maine's wonderful summer. And so I think there is just a natural tie to that. We are certainly, Commissioner Lambrew and Dr. Shaw and the governor and I are all having those discussions. We are looking what st at what states around us are doing as well and are trying to make some determinations. So we haven't had a final decision there. It certainly is as everything in the plan, right? We're having ongoing dialogue to continue to find that balance between public health and economic health and, and finding that perfect balance. So I don't have a good final answer for you on that, Don. We keep listening, we keep talking. The civil, the state of civil emergency order proclamation is still in effect till May 15th, subject to being extended. Excuse me, subject to being extended. extended? Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. And and uh, Dr. Shaw, one, one question about nursing homes. Since I believe all of these congregate care facilities, at least the nursing homes, have not allowed visitors for months, mm -hmm. uh, by definition, are the cases coming into these facilities and being transmitted 
uh, initially by staff members. Um, so Don, Don's question is around where we might think that the cases in congregate care settings are being introduced from. And Don, what we've seen from other states is um, it really does vary. In some cases, it might be staff. In some cases, it might be contractors. Um, we've, we've, our investigators have been trying to determine where in any one of the cases in Maine, uh, the first case might have been introduced from. Uh, as you can ma and imagine, in a large facility with a lot of folks coming in and coming out, uh, that's a challenge. In some of these facilities, residents themselves might be coming in and uh, going out in the community and such things. So it is a challenge from an outbreak investigation perspective. Uh, so it is really difficult to say. Uh, it, it could be staff, but there are a lot of other modes of transmission. So as of right now, we haven't made any final conclusions about the introduction of any of these cases in any particular facility. Uh, that, those investigations are still very much underway. Thank you. Great. Commodore, huh? Okay. Uh, uh, we will continue. And next up is uh, Steve Betts from the Courier-Gazette. Go ahead, Steve. Yes, Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I have a quick question for both you and for the governor. Do you have updated numbers on the number of out-of-state people who have been diagnosed in Maine and okay. vice versa? Sure thing, Steve. So Steve asks about the number of out-of-state folks who have been transferred out of Maine to other state health departments and vice versa, the number of Maine people living in other states that might be transferred in. Uh, we ran the, the numbers not too long ago and of our 1,374 cases across the state, 37 of them have been transferred in and 22 have been transferred out. So again, out of our one th almost 1,400 cases, 1,374 cases, 37 of them could be from out of state folks who might be from adjacent states who might have just been diagnosed here, who we've transferred back to their home jurisdictions. And then 22 individuals who might be main, who are main residents who might have been diagnosed in an adjacent state. Thank you. And then for, for Governor Mills or maybe the commissioner, the rent relief program, I know that that's to help the tenant, but I have a landlord asked, what happens if the tenant is not taking advantage of that? Can the landlord apply for that and get get paid for a, yeah. the tenant who's not paying? I can answer that. I think, uh, look, the tenants are still liable for the rent. We have not, and I don't believe can, uh, for, forgive a legal obligation of the rent to be paid, whether lease or month-to-month uh, -month tenancies. We've given out, um, I think, $1.3 million in rent relief checks to more than 2,600 individuals right now. The rent relief, the way we devised it, kind of on the fly, the relief is applied for by the renter because it's their income and their inability to pay based on COVID-19 reasons that results in the payment going out. The payment goes to the landlord because that's the person to whom it's owed. We've had good response on the rent relief program. Um, the landlord under our uh, setup cannot apply for that uh, rent relief themselves. Uh, they should urge the renters themselves to apply for it. It's a simple one page form online at mainhousing.gov uh, and through the cap agencies in the local areas. They sh people should be applying for it because it ultimately inures to their benefit to have some part of the rent paid by this program. It's a free program. So please, please encourage people to do so. And uh, before we turn to the next question, Steve, I, I wanted to clarify one thing. Uh, those folks that have been transferred in or transferred out, that does not mean that they are necessarily still within the state. Uh, someone who might have been transferred out could have been, for example, a New Hampshire resident who seeks their health care in Maine and got diagnosed here and is actually back in New Hampshire. So that does not mean that each and every one of those people is currently within the state. It could be that they were just here transiently, got diagnosed, and then have returned back to their home jurisdiction. The other, I think, really important point to note is that we have not heard from any hospitals or any first responders 
that out-of-state residents have posed any sort of problem to the healthcare system, nor are we aware of any secondary transmission, any cases that have resulted from someone from another state being here. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Steve Missler over at Maine Public. Uh, thank you. Um, I have one really quick question and then a couple just really probably quick questions. Just a clarification. On the DECD website where the new checklists have posted, there's no mention in phase three of the 14-day quarantine for out-of-state visitors, but there is on the governor's website. I'm assuming that's just an oversight on the DED, DECD site. Uh, yes, we have not made any adjustments to that policy at this point. Um, again, I think the governor's mentioned multiple times it's something we're actively working on. Got it. Okay. Um, and then for the governor, I, I guess um, it seems like yesterday's news about the new testing capacity is the impetus for the changes to this plan today. Mm -hmm. If that's true, can you explain how in practical terms this new capacity actually makes it safer to open some of these retail stores and restaurants and, and other places? In other words, what practical effect does additional testing have and whether it's safe to reopen a diner in, I don't know, Waldo County or something? Sure. Well, Two things. One is we, we picked next Monday, Monday the 11th, for retail in these 12 rural counties because we, and in talking with the industry, we figured it'd be a little easier for them to open sooner. The restaurants, May 18th, give them another week to prepare, get people back online, order food, etc. cetera. Um, so we're giving them extra time. The point is, and by the end of next week, we hope to have the whole testing capacity uh, expanded and operational. And at that time, we'll be able to do more testing um, in different regions uh, for more people. Um, simple as that. But that's one of the some six or so uh, met metrics, epidemiological metrics, that we'll use in gauging the flow, gauging um, whether or not what we're doing over here on the economic side and the reopening side is pushing the balloon open over here uh, by any measure. Oh, thank you for that. And then one really quick question for Dr. Shaw. I think he probably has this at his fingertips, but um, you've talked a lot about the um, positive rate for testing and that Maine was around 5%, I believe, last you mentioned it. Um, there was a Harvard Institute analysis that put us closer to 7% which is just below that 10% threshold to determine whether or not we're testing en enough. Do you know where we are now? Has there been any changes in light of some of these um, spikes in case counts over the last few days? Uh, so Steve asks about our positivity rate. Uh, this is a number that I, I personally, and as our team looks at our day-to-day -day trends, the positivity rate, that is to say the number of samples that are positive compared to all of the tests that we run. That to me is one of the key metrics to have us have a good sense of whether we're testing enough people. Uh, our positivity rate has ticked upward just a bit. Uh, the last time we ran the numbers, uh, Steve, uh, which was Wednesday, uh, we were we were at around six percent, um, uh, up a little bit from five point four percent. That was about forty eight hours ago. That number does change, and given that we're overall dealing with small numbers compared to say New York City those small day-to-day -day changes can have big changes in a percentage basis. But uh, we are hoping that uh, the, the introduction of this new capacity will drive that percentage down even further. Thank you. You bet. Um, since I'm up here, we'll go next to Dan Newman over at the Main Beacon. Uh, hi, uh, thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, Commissioner Johnson, I have two quick questions, if you'll allow me. Um, you said earlier that you've been working closely with business owners in those reopening conversations. I was just wondering if there are worker labor groups that are also involved in those conversations. And how do you ensure that viewpoint is being represented? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So the initial parts of these discussions have really been around business process. And, and managing and mitigating the risk around business process. Um, certainly as we go forward and expand and more employees are involved, we need to continue to expand that, um, expand those dialogues. We have been talking to not just business owners, employees, community leaders, um, public safety officials, obviously folks in, in health and human services. It's a very, it, they tend to be very broad discussions that move into very narrow discussions around process and then back out to kind of acceptance. So um, 
I think there there are lots of people involved in those discussions. Yeah, and we did receive a letter a few weeks ago, as I think most governors did, from a union that represents, among other things, grocery workers. And we they had three pages of recommendations and concerns, and we took those into consideration as well, to the extent those concerns reflect uh, what we believe to be appropriate public health um, public health measures. Good. Um, thank you. Uh, and I guess my second question would be for either uh, Commissioner Johnson or Governor Mills. Like going forward, uh, the Economic Recovery Committee that uh, the administration announced this week lists 20 business leaders and one labor representative. Uh, how do you arrive at the makeup of that group? It's not so much business leaders, it's people who have. Uh been innovative in different areas, different sectors of the economy. Um, people who I think have a great deal of respect in their own communities and in the state at large, whether they're community college people, university people, private sector, small business, large business people. Um, I think they reflect a great deal of the good thinking of the state of Maine, people with great ideas and people who will help move our state forward. The AFL-CIO is not exactly a minor player. The person we put on from the AFL-CIO is the head the executive director of the AFL-CIO, which is, I think, the biggest union in Maine, the biggest private union in Maine, union organization, excuse me, group of unions. Great. Uh, next question uh, goes to Amy Brown. Thank you. I, I'm not sure if this is for the governor or Commissioner Johnson. Uh, we're still hearing from a lot of listeners who are reporting concerns that there are a large number of people in stores, seems to be increasing number of people in stores who are not observing the physical distancing or wearing face covering. And with the recent reports of violence across the country, incidents where people who attempted to enforce those kinds of guidelines were victims of violence in response. Obviously, frontline workers like store employees are not wanting a confrontation on top of you know, putting themselves in danger just by going to work. So the situation is going to be expanded now with more businesses opening. Is there any way to enforce and monitor that? How How is compliance going to be uh, measured? And then I have a follow-up question for Dr. Shaw. Okay, I think I answered that earlier by talking about enforcement. and. You know what? If a store isn't doing what it's supposed to do, and please look at these these checklists, these guidelines on main.gov backslash DECD. Please, and members, members of the community, the public at large, should familiarize themselves with these guidelines because it's important to your own health, to your own safety, going into a store, going into a restaurant. We rely a great deal on the owners of these businesses to comply, but we rely as well on the public to spot check and to make sure that a business is complying. And if a business is not complying, let us know. Let the local law enforcement know and don't go there. If they're not enforcing these strict guidelines, don't go there. Tell your friends and neighbors and family members not to go there either because they're putting themselves at risk. That's the biggest consequence these businesses can incur, can suffer, is somebody going there and getting sick or even dying from the spread of the virus and that virus spreading amongst the entire community. I think that Dr. Shaw had a uh, just, uh, just to follow up with that, that question, I think that the people that they're talking about are fully aware of what the guidelines are. They're intentionally not following them at this point. Uh, you know, the, there are people who believe that the virus is a hoax, and at this point, more and more of them are just not following those rules. In, in Maine? Are you talking about in Maine? Maine? Yes. Well, I'm talking about in places where there's maybe one grocery store, so not going to that store is not really an option. Then call and let us know because that store has a license. That store may be in violation of the law or of the executive order and of the protocols, the guidelines. We want to know if stores are deliberately violating the policies. Thanks. And, and do, Dr. Shah, their national models are predicting more deaths now that um, most of the states are reopening ahead of what the initial White House guidelines were. What do the models, I know there are a lot of different models, and but the ones that you trust in most and watch, what are they saying we can expect from Maine in terms of trends are we thinking that there may be more deaths and more cases in a couple of weeks as things start opening up even more and people start returning to summer homes or tourists come to the state and maybe don't observe the 14-day quarantine 
Sure. So Amy asks about, I think fundamentally, Amy, you're asking about the potential risks associated with opening up and how, the, how that risk has been conceived of and reflected by some of the national models that have come out. And Amy, as you note first, that those models do change on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour basis. And some of what you're seeing is the result of states that opened up even a few weeks ago, and then uh, and, and as well as cases that were detected around that same time. Uh, our, our intention in moving in this direction is, of course, as the governor has stated, to do so in a manner that retains public safety and public health in mind. The guidelines uh, that Commissioner Johnson, working with, with members of the business community, as well as with members from the team at Maine CDC, have put forth are, are intended to allow uh, economic activity to resume, but in a manner that's safe. And so if followed, we don't anticipate there being significant spikes. But what's important that underlies all of this is that if individuals are, for example, medically vulnerable, if they have pre-existing health conditions, uh, if, as the governor noted, they are immunocompromised, then these guidelines are not necessarily a safety certificate to go out, but they uh, they, they, they are things right now at the rural level that we feel, given the low case numbers, can be done with appropriate safeguards in place. Uh, Any type of reopening move does necessarily entail some risk. And so our goal is to try to move in that direction while simultaneously making sure that there are guidelines in place, guardrails in place, to keep those businesses that do open up from trying to introduce more infections in the community. Um, We're gonna turn next to Caitlin Andrews over at the BDM. Good afternoon, thank you. I have um, two questions for Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew and then one for um, Governor Mills. You only get two. Uh, My first question is um, what kind of, on the expanded testing, um, what kind of guidance do you expect to give to providers on how that um, they'll be able to access that expanded testing? And how will you combat the perception that testing is limited and unavailable except to those who are most high risk? Sure, so uh, Caitlin, your first question is about how we will communicate with providers about the availability of new testing. Uh, Just to underscore for everyone, we have not yet removed the prioritization system that's been in place. We have to undertake the scientific process of validating the test and our lab's ability to do it. Once we have, we've cleared all of those hurdles, Uh, We intend to put out a bulletin through the health alert network system. That's the standard means through which Maine CDC communicates with healthcare providers and healthcare systems all across the state on a regular basis. It's how how we've communicated with them about everything COVID related. And it's the way that providers themselves have asked to be communicated with. What we intend to announce is first and foremost that if a provider wishes to submit a sample for a patient, they should follow the policies and procedures that they are already used to uh, to, to following. Providers have for decades submitted samples to the main CDC. COVID is obviously a new test, but the mechanism, the process that providers have followed has been a longstanding one. The requisition forms are on our website and hospitals, doctors and clinics know how to send samples to us, whether it's for blood lead or for COVID-19. So the process will remain the same the prioritization may go away. But what we also intend to couple that with, even though there won't be prioritization schemes, although there won't be clear guardrails, we do intend to provide physicians with the latest scientific recommendations. I say that because the fundamental decision of whether to to test any patient for COVID-19 lies with the physician. Maine CDC doesn't stand in the way, nor do we want to stand in the way between a physician and their decision to test a patient. But we do have an obligation to provide them the latest scientific guidelines, which we also intend to do following what our colleagues at the US CDC and the Infectious Disease Society of America have put forth about who they recommend should be tested, but the fundamental decision will still lie with the provider. Thank you. And a quick question um, for Commissioner Lambrew on the testing procurement form for the um, IDEX test. It mentions purchasing 3,000 tests a week for 12 weeks, but the um, it seems like you guys are looking to purchase at least 5,000 a, um, a week to more than triple your capacity. 
triple your capacity yet. Um, so how much is that ultimately going to cost? Are those 5,000 tests still going to be at $20 a pop? Yes. And so I would just go back a minute and say we're building our testing capacity, and that involves both building our platforms, our test kits, as well as our staff. So when we began the conversations with IDEX, we were thinking more like 3,000 a week. So the original draft of the contract said at least 3,000 a week. But in good hard work with Dr. Shaw and his team at the lab, we decided we could through expanding that staff, improving our processes, go to at least 5,000 per week. So we are modifying that contract. The cost of 5,000 per week is closer to $1.2 million still at $20 per test. And we thank our colleagues at IDEX for their partnership, both in donating the, donating the test kits, lending us the platform, and engaging with us on this contract. Thanks a lot, Caitlin. Thank you. You bet. Uh, wait, sorry, I still have one more question for um, Governor Mills, if that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Governor, why not go with a county-based reopening um, style plan from the beginning, given that most new cases have come from places where there have already been outbreaks for some time? You know, we're collecting the data day by day, um, and we're basing this decision on where the data stands right now, the number of cases, the number of hosp new hospitalizations, the number of people with symptoms in what areas. And right now, this uh, plan seems to be reasonable uh, and it's uh, appropriate to protect people in those areas and yet not allow more community spread. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, and we've done this, you know, these aren't decisions made on the fly. These are decisions made after days and weeks of consultation with all kinds of stakeholders uh, and with public health, health officials and providers in the areas in question. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank We're going to turn next to Michael Fern over at the Main Edge. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I have a question for Governor Mills and one for Commissioner Lambrew. Uh, Governor Mills, an interesting question was posed this morning on the George Hill Retire Show. So, unfortunately, I can't take credit for it, uh, but it's worth asking. Is it possible to re uh, redeploy or retask state workers who are still on payroll but are idled or just not as busy, say, at DMV or DFAS, uh, to plug some of the new positions at unemployment or CDC? Well, first of all, there's nobody idle in state employment. They are all working. They are all working, and many of them are working like the CDC people seven days a week. Nobody's right. idle, and nobody's idle at the Department of Labor, and nobody's idle at the Department of Administrative Financial Services, and nobody's idle at DECD, nobody's idle at DHHS, nobody's idle at the Department of Education. Whoever thinks somebody's idle is wrong. <laughs> Secondly, we have, we have swapped people in and out of different departments to supplement what's going on at the Department of Labor when needed, as needed, when needed. You know, uh, I think we've done reasonably well in that area. Uh, we're doing everything we can to keep, up on, keep on top of the numbers of the Department of Labor. And we are using people from other areas, Department of Corrections personnel, for instance, and I think some people from Workers' Comp, and then going back to w with the regular jobs. But they're staying on top of their regular jobs. That's important to know. Uh, Commissioner Lambrew wanted to add something to that. Another question. Oh, you had another question. Oh, sure. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Lambrew, Maine is one of only three states where reopening dental services is still open ended. Uh, the other two are New Jersey and California. And as Governor Mills mentioned Sorry, earlier, can you unfortunately re are, re reopening what services? Dental. Uh, dental. Dental. Services. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in speaking with Brad Rand earlier today, who is president of the Maine Dental Association, uh, dentists are starting to feel that public health is starting to be threatened because this forced neglect is causing some ongoing patient issues that are becoming permanent or irreparable, especially with kids who need much more attention. Is there a question um, in there, Mike? Is there a question? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, are, are you working to get them reopened? Yeah, so we spoke to Dr. Rand and other people at the Maine Dental Association yesterday. We continue to work with our U.S. CDC colleagues as well because our challenge is, at this moment, the U.S. CDC does not recommend routine dental care. Its guidance that is dated in April says to postpone all but non-urgent care. We are hoping in the coming days that the U.S. CDC might consider either updating that guidance or explaining that guidance. Should that not happen, the state of Maine will engage again 
we as the Maine Dental Association, the hygienists, and our public health experts on whether or not we should issue our own guidance. We generally, though, prefer to use federal guidance, the National Association guidance, and other professional association guidance. We're trying to approach this process through a collaborative way, in a collaborative way with our healthcare partners, but this is the rare example of the U.S. CDC being at odds with the American Dental Association. We're hoping to get some clarification in the coming days. Well, thank you. Oh, uh, I'll go to the next question, which is uh, Kit Harrison. This question is for Dr. Shaw. Um, according to census data, 1.6% of Mainers are African American or black. According to the newest data the CDC has released on race and COVID in Maine, the known infection rate here is 7.7%. The data the CDC released listed 302 people this week who have chosen not to disclose their race or ethnicity. So I'm thinking that's a lot of data missing. And I wondered if you recommended that given the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on people of color, healthcare providers should perhaps make reporting of race and ethnicity mandatory. Uh, so Kit asks whether in light of the, the um, so Kit correctly notes that many people have, when Maine CDC epidemiologists have reached out to them, many individuals have declined to provide their race or ethnicity to Maine CDC as part of our contact tracing. Uh, over 300 individuals, uh, about 20% of all of the cases in individuals who have declined. And so Kit asks whether uh, we should make reporting of such data mandatory. It's a good and difficult policy question, Kit. And I think the question that's, uh, that underlies it is, why might it be that certain individuals would not want to report their racial and ethnic data? And what we've seen in other states and, and in a conversation I've had with a counterpart of mine in the Pacific Northwest, there is some concern that by reporting those data, they themselves could be revealing negative implication information, not about themselves, but about their own social and ethnic group. And so I think we have to, to, to look and think really hard about whether we make mandatorily reporting of racial and ethnic data something we want to do, given that the ethnic groups themselves may have reservations about doing so. As it turns out, I'm actually having a call tomorrow with members of various immigrant and new Mainer communities, having a meeting with them via Zoom tomorrow. And one of the items on the agenda is just this issue. If there's a way to urge their own constituencies to report if asked, that of course helps our data get more accuracy. But we also fully recognize that for a lot of people, when the health department calls, mm -hmm. talking about your race may not be something that folks want to do. And we want to respect that privacy boundary as much as possible. So it's a difficult question. It's a good question and it's one we're thinking about. Thanks a lot, Kit. Uh, I'd like to turn now to TJ Tremble over at ABC7. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon, Governor. Hi, TJ. I have, two quick, I have two quick questions. What is the likelihood the 14-day quarantine may be lifted sooner than called for in the initial plan with the outburst of uh, dissatisfaction with that coming from the tourism industry? We're working towards that goal. We're not there yet. That's the simple answer. Is, is there a more difficult one? Answer. I'm sorry? Is there a, a, a less simple answer? No. <laughs> All right. Thanks, TJ. We are going to turn now to Dustin Vladkowski over at New England Cable News. Thanks. Uh, my question, I have two. The, the first is, how should people in counties that are still more restricted approach some of the tenants in this reopening? Places like Bath and Brunswick, for instance, are in different counties with now different rules, but just 10 minutes apart. Mm -hmm. So it was a message for folks, if you're still in a restricted county, don't travel to these other counties and the businesses in them. You're asking, is that the message? Could, could yeah, you? I mean, what's, how, how do you clarify that for folks who are trying to think about that as a decision they're making? We're not telling people not to travel but we are telling everybody to be cautious, keep being cautious and stay at home whenever you can. Just because a store is open or a restaurant 10 miles down the road is open doesn't mean you have to go there. Look, I know a lot of people wanna get out right now. 
the weather's getting a little better, although I don't know about tonight and tomorrow. But the weather's getting better and people are anxious to get out. Um, but still keep in mind, we are in the middle of a pandemic. That's not going to change tomorrow or the ne or next week or the week after that. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, I think, right, we're, we... Um, we're trying to find, continue to find this balance, right, of protecting public health and bringing the economy along with it because economic health is critically important as well. So, you know, we have to create some delineation there and there are obvious sectors around community transmission markets. So that's where we set them. We didn't put other requirements, but to the governor's point, we're hoping people take the situation very seriously and are, are really thoughtful about the actions they take. Next and, and similar, your answer might be the same, but in a similar vein, can you clarify too what you were saying about small groups? The stay at home order is still in effect, but yet these businesses are open. So should you not have people over your house until the order is lifted, but public places are a bit different? Well, there are a lot of precautions about public places, including wearing a face covering whenever you can, um, public gatherings of no more than of 10 or more. <laughs> um, that kind of thing. I still wouldn't recommend people come over to your house in large gatherings. Please don't start having big parties at your house. It's the same principle. Are you going to be within proximate space of people who are not household members? And if you are, don't do it. It's sort of common sense more than a regulatory matter. It's simply don't do it if it puts yourself, your friends, your family, your neighbors at risk. All right. Uh, I think the last question is from Patrick Whittle. The Associated Press. Patrick? Yeah. Um, so I, I have two things uh, that are very unrelated. Um, first of all, and you, you've touched on this a, a little bit, and I appreciate it, but um, as, as we do more testing, uh, typically we find more positives. And I'm, I'm curious if there's a possibility of a of a, of a surge in positives that could sort of change the calculus about reopening the state. And the, the second thing, which, as I said, is, is very, very different, is uh, the, the fisheries relief from the CARES Act is finally being distributed. Oh, yeah. And Maine, yeah, Maine is getting 20 million out of the 300 million. And I'm curious if you feel that that is fair and um, how it could be used. Uh yeah, and Dr. Shaw touched on that issue earlier about the, the denominator of the number of tests and the positive, but you want to address that again? Sure. Thank you, Governor. So, Patrick, um, our goal here is to increase testing capacity, which we hope translates to more tests, which will potentially translate to more positives, but it may also translate to even more negatives. So long as the more, as long as we get more negatives than positives, our hope is that the overall positivity rate that percentage of positives divided by total will go down. That's the idea. It's, it's predicated on the idea that we want to cast the biggest and broadest net possible to look under every single rock out there. However, in so doing, we may also find clusters of cases that we didn't know about before. That's part of the, part of the reason we want to expand capacity. If we find those clusters and they are significant and they increase uh, our, our positivity rate to levels that we see like Boston or New York or Chicago, that will give us pause. One of the things our epidemiologists do is stay on the lookout for those clusters, for those groups of cases, for those outbreaks. If we see them, we've already thought about the ways in which we would respond and of course the way in which that might affect any of the discussions that we've been having today. So it's something, we, we go into this expanded testing capacity, eyes wide open. We know that when we look for things, we may find them, but we also know that we've got a plan in place for if or when we detect those new cases. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, and thank you for the question about the fisheries. I think um, we did learn early this week that Maine would be receiving about 20 million of the 300 million um, that the Congress has appropriated for relief for the fisheries. Look, I think Maine, Maine fishermen commercial fishermen have suffered disproportionately compared to other states. Uh, we welcome the support that the federal government, the Congress has uh, allocated to us, but I think we can do more. We're working with a congressional delegation. We will fight for more money, more relief for our fishermen who've suffered disproportionately compared to 
all the other New England states and to most of the states in this country. And I think that their losses are um, a high priority for us. And we want to make them whole in any way we can. And that was the last question. Yes, Governor. Oh, my. Well, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Commissioner Lambrew. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Um, I've been receiving dozens and dozens of cards and letters every day, and I want to thank everybody that I haven't been able to respond to, either by email or by written card, or the many, many phone calls and the emails that have come through the portal by the thousands. Thank everybody who submitted suggestions and comments, however off the cuff they might have been. Um, I got a card today from a woman who says, as a nurse and also the wife of someone who has cancer, I'm thankful for your efforts, Dr. Shaw and Governor Mills, to keep us safe. Thank you, Sarah, for writing that. These are the people we think about every day as we try to redesign and reopen the economy, as we try to give relief of every degree of all sorts across the state of Maine. I think today, as Dr. Shaw mentioned, that Mother's Day is coming up. And many of us will be celebrating, hopefully, at least by Zoom with family members. And those of us whose mothers have passed will be thinking of other people who are mothers. There are 10 people on ventilators right now among the 23 people in intensive care across the state of Maine. Some of those individuals are mothers. Some are grandmothers. And I pray and hope for their recovery on this upcoming Mother's Day this weekend. Thank you to the people of Maine for remaining resilient, courageous, cooperative, and compassionate. Thank you again. Thanks, Josh.